for the open meeting law. GL chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020, order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Great Barrington Select Board will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and our parties with a right and a requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Pursuant to Mass General Law 7C 30A Section 20F, after notifying the chair of the public body, any person may make a video or audio recording of an open session of a meeting of a public body or may transmit the meeting through any medium. At the beginning of the meeting, the chair shall inform other attendees of any such recordings. So this is being recorded by the town through Zoom. Any member of the public wishing to speak at the meeting must receive permission of the chair. The listing of agenda items are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. So we will start with a motion for the select board to convene as board of sewer commissions. So Can moved. We, excuse me. So moved. Second. So I have a motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Roll call vote, Lee. Aye. Kate. Aye. Bill. Aye. Ed. Aye. And I. It's unanimous. Mark, or you. Sorry, thanks, Steve. So in your packet tonight, you have a list of uh, sewer abatements from July 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019. I'm happy to answer any questions you have about them. I, can. I have one quick question, and I know that I've done this many times before. I'm wondering why the abatements are just half of the current bill and not more, or I'm sure there's a, a rubric for it. I just can't remember. That's a good question. I, I can't answer. I'm sorry. I can, I can get the answer and, and email it out to the group, though. Okay. Anyone else? Do you have a motion to approve? So move. And second. So motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Any discussion by the board? Hearing none, roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? 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 Aye. Thank you. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. So it's unanimous. We now convene back as select board. Um, and just for everyone in the audience, maybe someone new, when meetings are held remotely, all votes are roll call votes. Um, select board's announcements, statements, general comments by the board. Lee. None for me. Kate. Kate? You're muted. Hi. Do you have no questions or comments by the board? Nothing. Thank you. Bill? Nothing. Ed? That was simple. Uh, town manager's to report. Mark? Thanks, Steve. I have a short list of updates for you tonight. Uh, Chief Walsh is on the line. I'd like to ask if you could promote him as a panelist. He's here to provide us with an update on Officer Peebles and his certification as a drug recognition expert. As I find in my well, there he is. Chief, you should be unmuted. You just have to unmute yourself now, Chief. I think you're all set, Chief.
Steve, would you like me to continue with updates and circle back to the chief? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, next up on my list and also on the agenda, uh, number one and two are both related to the Housatonic Waterworks. <laughs> and I just wanted to update the board and let them know that as, let you guys know that as instructed, I drafted and mailed the letter to the Department of Public Utilities after our last <laughs> meeting. Uh, requesting that they permit the Housatonic Waterworks company to issue a rate adjustment for customers impacted by the royally discolored water this summer. Uh, a copy of that letter, of course, was in your packet. I also invited Nancy Stevens, director of the consumer division at DPU, to join us tonight, but unfortunately, I have not received a response from her. Uh, I did send her this letter. Uh, both by mail and email, and a few emails asking her to join us tonight. Uh, I apologize. I, I haven't heard from her, so I don't think she'll be joining us, but I'll keep trying and, and see if I can get her to join a future meeting. Uh, I did also review communications between Houstonic Waterworks and DEP. Some of those were shared by Eileen uh, through her newsletter, and I'd be happy to share those on our website if others are interested in seeing those. Um, that back and forth communication between the two companies. Uh, most of the discussions you'll see uh, in those letters refer to sampling, discoloration, chlorination, pH, polyphosphates, um, and corrosion control, and then also water main leaks and breaks. So that's all I have on uh, for Houstonic water tonight. Mark, I, had a, I just had a question on that. Is this the right time to ask about the water? Go ahead. Just, just wondering, is there a timeline? And, and excuse me if you've already gone over this, but is there a rough timeline on when the appraisal will be coming and when the phase two study will be completed? No, we're still uh, reaching out to engineers right now. The appraisal, I will say, may take a little longer. We're looking for a company that both the town and Houston Waterworks can agree on. Um, my concern with that is that if we go ahead and do an appraisal by an independent engineer and then uh who's Waterworks water works disagrees with it of course they'll probably hire their own and do their own appraisal so i'm trying to just save us all time and money and find one engineer that we can both agree on so we i don't have a timeline yeah um but but sean is working on both of those things now so i hope to be okay. reporting back okay thank you yeah um the next item on my list is the leash law enforcement. We did put out a press release last week, and I just wanted to mention as a friendly reminder to dog owners in town, and those from out of town, that the police department and our animal control officer will be stepping up enforcement of the leash law. Uh, the first offense <coughs> violation is a $50 fine, so I hope people take this seriously. Um, areas of concern at this point are Lake Mansfield, the McAllister Park up by uh, Haley Road, uh, Cemetery, both in Great Barrington and Housatonic. Um, so please just leash your dogs and clean up after them when you're on public property. And the last item I have on my list for tonight is an update on Cook's Garage. Uh, at the last meeting, I think this has come up a couple times, uh, questions arose around Cook's Garage, the water source at that location, and its potential use and restrictions as a public water supply. Uh, Chris Rembold is on the line. He's done some research, and I'd like to ask him if he can provide an update to the board. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, and I think Mark passed this email along to you. What we know about Cook's Garage, uh, the, the well in Cook's Garage, is it's about 400 gallons a minute of pretty high quality water. Uh, it's neither river water nor Housatonic uh, Waterworks water. We know that. But we don't know the source of it. It could be coming from a spring somewhere up on the mountain, or it could be a, a well drilled directly downwards under the garage. Uh, we've not been able to determine that. And uh, one would think that over 100, 150 years of people walking that mountain, somebody would have found the spring by now, but nobody seems to know where it is. So the question came up of, you know, well, uh, can, can Cook's Garage be developed if that's a water source? 
if it's a public water source, if if the water is below Cook's Garage, and that is the public water source, there would have to be a, a zone one protection area around Cook's Garage. What in the town would have to own or have conservation restrictions over that whole area. So that would stretch, you know, that would hit a lot of downtown New Tonic. So if Cook's Garage itself was a public water source, it, well, it can't be, let's just say that, because uh, because the town uh, wouldn't own that property and, uh, and that area is already all developed. So if the source is somewhere up on the mountain, that would make it relatively more straightforward to protect the source, but still, it's all an unknown. Um, so, long story short, uh, it's not a public water source now. Developing it as a public water source would be impossible, and if we did, there would be some consequences for land use in the village. Anyone have any questions on that? Pretty straightforward. Lee, go ahead. I just, if um, if it's valuable, let's say if we are able to find the source, it sounds like it could be valuable water. Um, is that something that we would factor in in the long term, whether Great Barrington wants to take advantage of that? It probably has uh, industrial or commercial uses. I'm not sure how <laughs> we value it. Uh, if we can't exactly find the source, uh, that's something that we'll have to deal with when we uh, auction or put the property out for RFP eventually. It's, uh, and I should note that the Cook's Garage, uh, the town's ownership of Cook's Garage, we own 50% of the water and the abutting property owns 50% of the water. There's a shared water rights agreement uh, in the deeds. Who's the fifty percent abutter? Who's that person? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the landowner. It's the land with the uh, red metal building on it. Is there, a, yeah? Is there a test or, or what would you do to find out where the source of that water was? Is that something we could hire somebody to determine? We've done a little bit of investigating, uh, and it's been difficult to do so. Um, I think it would take a little bit of money to uh, do a, a test and do some engineering to figure out where it was. I have no idea if it would be successful or how much that would cost. I mean, I will say that we had uh, experts up there with us, uh, DPW superintendent and I were, were up there and uh, they put, they essentially put a current, an electrical current on the pipes and they tried to trace that current. And they couldn't find any lateral pipes going out of the building of, of that size. So some people thought, well, that means it goes straight down. But other people will say, well, they didn't have the technology to dig that type of well at that time. It's, it's a mystery. Um, we could investigate it and let you know what it would cost to really try to find it. And not sure if it would be successful. Would a future owner, like, I mean, just for say, if somebody wanted to put a brewery there or a bottling facility there, could they utilize that spring as a, or, or do we not know? I don't know. I feel like if we were to get to the point of wanting to sell it, knowing the answer to that would probably decide whether or not we wanted to see how, where that well was coming from because it would either determine whether it would be an asset to selling that property or an asset to the town. Um, but otherwise it probably doesn't make that much of a difference to know. The, the likelihood of this being a drinking water asset to the town is extremely low. Right. Uh, it's not impossible. Right. It may be an asset for a commercial and industrial user and it would be easier for them to do that work on their end than maybe yeah. for us to do it up front. Okay. Just to, I mean, we can yeah. investigate if you want. But. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Anyone else? Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Chief Falls, are you on the line? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to announce tonight that one of our police officers, Officer Christopher Peebles, 
has completed training as a drug uh, recognition expert. Um, as marijuana has been decriminalized and with the advent of marijuana shops, for a while now, it's been a concern in law enforcement. How do you, you know, prove or prosecute driving under the influence of drug cases? I think we talked about some of this a little bit maybe back in the spring as a town. What train were we going to do? And um, it's totally different from investigations involving driving under the influence of alcohol. It's uh, totally different. And... No officers can do this drug testing uh, except ones that have completed this training. Um, so, again, it's totally different from alcohol, and you can't just put any officer into it and say, you know, do these tests. Um, in the springtime, Officer Peebles went to uh, two weeks of training in Franklin, Mass., and that was followed by third week out in uh, Arizona at the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. Now, in Arizona, they actually spent a week uh, testing live inmates as they were coming into the facility as part of their uh, uh, training. So that was quite an experience. So he's been all over the place uh, this summer um, getting this training, and uh, uh, we're very happy to, you know, he did this on behalf of, of uh, the, uh, the department. Um, so later on tonight, I'll be issuing a formal press release with a few more de details. But um, with all Officer Peebles is on board. He's now one of two in Berkshire County to have this training. And again, no other officer can do this for drugs except these two officers, and Officer Peebles is uh, one of two. So uh, um, a great credit for him, you know, going on the road and doing all this training, and uh, it really puts us ahead of the curve on this issue, which we've talked about before, which is becoming more and more prevalent, as the marijuana issue, you know, continues to expand across the, across the land. So um, that's a big announcement for us. Two other quick things while, while I'm here, if I could. I'd also just like to give a shout out and a thank you to uh, uh, the flag company in Springfield that donated the flags for us for the GB Park down by the Brown Bridge. Um, Mr. Jeffrey Barbo of Awards Company in Springfield. Uh, he read about it in, in the press, and he sent us like 164 flags. And my officers went down and you know, replaced the ones that had been stolen uh, earlier in July. And um, I just want to give him a shout out and thank him for that. The, the, the ones we didn't use, which were a lot, we sent over to the highway department to be used in future years to keep that park uh, decorated. So the GP Park looks nice with the uh, decoration my officers did. And they're still there. That's the good news. And uh, we hope everybody enjoys them. And lastly, just real quickly, over the weekend, we have had um, a, a few car break-ins. So since I'm here tonight, we want to continue to remind people that, um, you know, please lock your cars, remove any valuables. And if you see anything or hear anything in the middle of the night that's suspicious, please call 911. We want to know. So uh, we've uh, had a few issues over the weekend. So we just want to... Can you remind people, um, please lock your cars. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Lee? Um, thank you, Chief Wolf. I just had a question um, about uh, Officer Peebles, how this will work if he's uh, two officers in the county that has this specialized training. Will he be going um, out of Great Barrington to um, other towns if there is an issue, or how will that work? Um, the, the town manager and I have discussed this, you know, and uh, the way we're working it is that in our annual letters to our neighboring towns in South County about dispatch and lockup fees and the breathalyzer, we informed them that this service is available to our South County towns, everybody adjacent to us, but any cost involving overtime, they'd be responsible for. So if he's on duty, you know, we'll send him. That's not a cost if he's on duty. But if he's being called out after hours and certainly for court time, any overtime, we'll send him an invoice and they'll have to pay for that. So this costs the town uh, zero dollars. And I'm, I'm glad you asked that week. Um, I also should have mentioned the uh, 
the cost of the training was covered by a grant as well. I mean, the flights to Arizona and the hotels and staying in hotels in Franklin, all those costs were covered by the grant as well. So this whole program has zero cost to the taxpayers, and we're going to keep it that way. You know, we'll offer it, but you're going to have to pay for it. Thank you. Does that go the same for um, him being over time? Like, it, will he get called in at, at night, or I don't know what his shift is, but off-shift off hours for him um, to Great Barrington calls? I don't know. Yes, he works. He works a midnight shift, so he's okay. on duty. So he's on duty. We'll send him. That's that's fine. You know, like any mutual aid call. But anything uh, outside of his work hours, um, there'll be invoice for his overtime hours, including court time. And if they want to pay for that, that's fine. Or, or otherwise, they, they don't get the service. So the the town will be paying for the town of Great Barrington would be paying for that if it's in in connection with his. With an arrest in Great Barrington, or or a ticket, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't catch the question. Just if it if it's not really if it's related to Great Barrington. So if there if he's going to a court date for a, a Great Barrington case, Great Barrington's paying the overtime for that. The town itself. Yes. Yeah, it's a yeah. Great Barrington case that runs over his twelve to eight shift. Yeah, like like any and shift. Now, and is he the officer that just got the the service dog as well or is that a different that's a different Chris? no that that was officer Belastro. thank you thank you anyone else thank you chief hey public hearings we have three of them tonight special permit application from hillcrest educational centers Inc. to operate a group home at 6 Ramsdale Road, Great Barrington, for sections 7.6 and 10.4 of the zoning bylaw. And I will allow <laughs> Attorney Anthony Doyle to speak. And while I'm doing that, there are 72, including board members, on the call right now. Do we need to reopen the public hearing? Or no? um, yeah, we're going to do that first. Ed. Thank you. Go ahead, Ed. Motion to reopen the public hearing. To open the public hearing. Oh, open the public hearing. Sorry. I'll second. Second. Motion second. and a second. Uh, roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. Attorney Doyle? Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name's Anthony Doyle. I'm sitting in my office with Attorney John Barry. We're here on behalf of Hillcrest Educational Centers. As you know from the paperwork before you, we have a an application for a special permit to convert the property at 6 Ramsdale Road into a group home for our uh, Brookside campus. Literally, this property is across the street. Uh, we have presented our petition. We believe that we meet all the town's criteria. There will be no adverse effect on attendance at public schools. There will be no increase in vehicular traffic. There will be no change in the number of legal residents. There will be no increase in municipal services or usage costs. There will be no adverse effect on public utilities. There will not be an increase in the requirement for fire or police protection. And we will continue to pay um, it through a pilot program, so you're not even really losing the tax revenue of the property. Uh, we think that this is the best use for this property. There's no intended change to the exterior of the building. Any interior changes would be minimal at best, and I honestly don't believe we have any desired changes inside. Uh, we do have, hopefully on the line, Sean Cousin, who is our executive director, Melissa Orazio, who is our program director, and Jim Sorrentino, who is the director of facilities, if you have any questions about the application. The design is for three residents, three students from Brookside, to transition towards returning to their communities, and they would be supervised by two staff members on a 24-hour basis. These staff members are not intended to be sleeping at the property. They are working in three separate shifts, so we have the proper supervision. Okay. Question. Any questions from the board before I open up to public comment? Okay, is there anyone 
And in order to do this uh, for the public, we need to raise your hand through the Zoom. There is a raise your hand icon. If you're on a phone, you hit star nine um, to raise your hand, and then it'll be star six to unmute yourself. So is there anyone from the public who wishes speak, to speak in favor or opposition? I'm going to give it a second just to make sure we don't leave anyone out. Being no one who wants to speak in favor of opposition, board members, do you have any questions? No. No. It's fine to me. And I see no questions from the board. And I think we are safe to close the um, public hearing. If I may, Mr. Chairman, can I yes. make one more comment? Of course. Mr. Rembold submitted to you a draft for findings of fact and basis for decision. I would just note that the very last paragraph, the very, very last line, I believe yes. contains a typographical error. It does, and he has notified the board of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, a motion to close the public hearing. We'll move. Second it. So I have a motion and a second. It's a roll call vote to close the public hearing. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. It's unanimous to close the public hearing. Ed, a motion on the findings. Yeah, uh, move to approve the findings with one change. The very last sentence where it says, in consideration of the findings, the board finds that the possible benefits of the proposal do scratch the word not outweigh possible detrimental impacts of the proposal. I'll second. A motion by Ed, a second by Bill. Any discussion by the board? Being on, roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? And I. Uh, uh, motion, Ed. I, I move in view of the approved findings of fact to approve special permit number 912-20. Uh, second. Motion and a second. A roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. It's unanimous. Thank you, Attorney Doyle. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good evening. You too. Next is a continuation of the special permit application from Guido's Realty, Inc., 1020 South Street, Pittsville, Mass., for construction of a large-scale commercial development in the B2 zone and an increase in impervious surface in the Water Quality Protection District. The proposal includes the expansion of the existing Guido's Retail Store at 760 Main Street, Great Barrington, as well as parking, stormwater, utilities, and site work. The application is being filed for sections 3.1.4C11, 7.9, 7.12, 9.2, and 10.4 of the zoning bylaw. Um, I will first uh, let... Uh, as soon as I find him, I will... And he was on the line, um, Matt Quinton. Mark, do you see him? I'd also have Matt Nassiero. Okay, that's good. Matt has his hand raised. Okay, so I will do give it to Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Just unmute yourself. Is this, you, are you looking for Matt Nassiero or Matt Quinton? Well, I was looking for Matt Punton, but you're sure not a second place in this. So, no, 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 I understand that. I'm sure he's on the line. We were speaking just shortly. He was on the line. I just don't see him right now. Uh, I'll find him. Yeah, thanks. There he is. Matt, go ahead. Do you have anything to add? From uh, okay. Formally reopening. Hi, uh, Matt Punton here. Yes, uh, a little bit to add since our last meeting. Um, uh, the the one kind of outstanding item that I recall at our last select board meeting. Okay, hold on one second. Do I have a motion to reopen the public hearing? I neglected that. A move. Uh, second. Uh, roll call vote. Lee. Aye. Kate. Aye. Bill. 
I. And I. And I. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry about that. Um, no, sorry, my fault. <laughs> sure. So just as a refresher to our last select board meeting from two weeks ago, I believe the only um, item of question or item of concern had to do with trees. Yes. Um, based on the, the landscape uh, requirements along Route 7. Um, we have since uh, gone back to the drawing board, literally, and suggested that we add four additional trees along the frontage of our property, in addition to four trees that are also existing on the southern property. Um, we presented that to the planning board uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and here we are also presenting it to you with a few details. I, I know that a letter has been circulated, <clears throat> excuse me, a letter and email um, from the tree committee that might have some additional comments, and, and we're happy to discuss those. Board members, do you have anything you want to ask? I um, was going to offer a condition that this be subject to approval of a tree planting and maintenance plan by the tree committee. Would that be a huge obstacle? On, on our end, as the applicant, I think we're okay with that. If I could uh, just double check with uh, Matt Massiero. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make sure that that, that everything is is reasonable. Right. You know, I, and I also want to. I also want to. I, I understand that they're concerned about some of the properties on Stockbridge Road, um, and and the way they look at this point. But but I I don't think our property. With what we've done there, you know, compares to that. So, so we're concerned about, you know, how the southern entrance to Great Barrington looks. But don't, don't, don't think we don't want to work with them. Well, you know, I, I would agree with Ed. I, I would, um, you know, like to see if that we could condition a permit based on a, a tree planting um, plan approved by the tree committee. So, I would feel comfortable with that. It doesn't sound from what they sent to us like they are that they're that far off from what you want to do. No, I'm, we're fine with that. Right. You know, right. and I'll also bear in mind, I, I think the fact that, you know, they, they want, you know, $450 per, per tree, I'm not opposed to that either. But okay. you have to understand that this project is probably going to be over budgeted as, as, as it is. And the tax base that I'm going to be paying the town of Great Barrington is probably going to triple or quadruple. So, so let's not let's not forget those as well. We we appreciate that, Matt. No, I understand. Anyone else on the board? There's some sort of happy medium we can come up with this evening. I mean, I don't know. If I could speak, Matt Punton again here. Um, yeah. We, we between myself and the owners, we went back and forth, and we read the letter. I mean, we just got that letter late Friday afternoon. So we haven't had a whole lot of time to change plans. Um, I'm open to uh, the board's su possible suggestion of just having a final approval by the tree committee, um, uh, you know, as a condition. I, I think that might make most sense because we, we're really looking to get forward, we're moving forward on this project. So if that condition is agreeable, we're okay with it. Anyone else from the board? So if no one else from the board we need to close the public hearing. So moved. Um, I'm going to hold off one, just one second. Yeah, go ahead. The conditions that the um, tree committee recommended, would you be willing to meet those, or is there, you'd rather meet somewhere in the middle? I'm not sure I could meet them all. Okay. The advantage to meeting them, Matt, and I understand you're concerned and maybe Bill's going in the same direction, then there is no ambiguity. This is your permits ready to go and you could, you know, start as soon as you get the building permits. So that's the only advantage to that, but I understand your concern. So we'll go with a, a discussion with the tree committee, approval of the tree committee. Uh, this is, is that, is, now will that hold up? Will that hold up what we're trying to do tonight? No. Okay. Chris, again, I'm, I'm happy to meet with Holly, Eva, you know, Mike, all of the, all of them, right. to talk about it down at the site. <clears throat> yeah, that'll have to be a posted site visit, but I'm sure that can be arranged. Sure. Chris, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, uh, this is Chris Rimmel, excuse me. I just want to uh, um, 
you know, it could, it could open up a can of worms if the tree committee uh, changes things and, and wants more trees or different conditions and or the applicant can't meet those proposed conditions, then what's their option? Uh, because you will have written and issued a permit subject to somebody else's approval, uh, which could get a little bit sticky. Uh, there's another board that actually does have jurisdiction here. It could be the planning board, which hasn't finished its site plan review. So you could issue a, a special permit tonight if that's uh, the way you're going uh, and uh, specifically let the planning board write into their permit whatever conditions the tree committee and the applicant come up with. How would we phrase that? Or would so Chris, we yeah, how would that, um, since they've already approved it without having um, the tree, how does that work? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going on the fly here. So uh -huh. I, I just uh, am cautioning the board not to. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable with letting any, you know, this is our jurisdiction. Yeah. If we turn one part of this over um, to another board, no matter what that board is, and there is a, a holdup, uh, it's on us. And, and I think we have the ultimate say on this. So the, the applicant has requested a waiver from the Route 7 landscaping requirements, uh, the requirement of, of a tree every 25 feet of frontage. The planning board supports the waiver as proposed by the applicant. The tree committee has given you some suggestions that differ slightly. So your options could be to approve the plan as presented with the four trees on, on the frontage where the grocery store is. Um, you could go all with the tree committee uh, suggested conditions or you could make your own. May I ask the the plan that was sent to us was it earlier today or maybe on Friday right. is that with new landscaping or was that the original landscaping because there is definitely more trees in that plan. That was additional those are additional trees that you received in the in the packet that was a um, and how many and how many additional trees I couldn't quite tell. Uh, uh, I'll let the applicant speak to that. Sure. That, that, that plan I believe you received today that I forwarded to Chris, it shows four new pin oak trees being planted along Route 7. So four new trees in addition to four um, at the southern building. And just as a, a side note, the tree committee or the tree commission even made note that additional trees could be planted at the rear of the property, um, which we are actually already proposing anyways. We're proposing four uh, trees to be planted along the buffer zone of the wetlands. Um, right. the, the tree commission actually kind of made that as a side note that if you can't get them in the front, maybe you can put them in the rear. Um, and, and so we're up. And there were also, oh, go ahead. sorry to interrupt you, Matt. I apologize. There would also seem like there were a couple of dogwoods in there too, as well that I hadn't noticed before. Is that correct? Uh, at the rear of the property, I believe that's correct. There was um, some sycamores and some dogwoods. It's more along the lines of buffer zone planting as it relates to the Conservation Commission. So, Matt, I had a question. Um, so the plan that the tree committee sent was on Friday, um, and I believe that you didn't have a, a chance to work that into a new plan. Is that what I'm hearing, or you just chose not to work well, into the new plan? Co correct in regards to we received a letter from the tree committee on Friday. Um, we had already done an updated landscaping plan for the planning board the previous week. So the plan you received today is our latest plan and it does not show anything additional that the tree committee suggested. Just, just to be straightforward. Okay. They suggested another three in the main island. They suggested a couple more near the southern entrance. They even suggested removing some of the existing um, vegetation down near the, the house and replacing mm -hmm. it with a tree. Um, our latest plan does not reflect those those suggestions. Matt, if I'm correct, they said that some of those trees were dead or dying? They said one is borderline, yeah. Uh, there's a sugar maple that's not looking too healthy, I think, is what it was. Um, he mentioned, uh, yeah, the sugar maple. There's an elm that's not, and, a, and yeah, an elm tree that's not looking too great. Um, 
I'm not quite sure if they're suggesting, you know, remove them now and plant them. We'd be more um, open to, you know, when they come down, of course, we can replace them. Um, we just weren't ready to pull the trigger on just cutting them down just yet. I'd be happy to see them replaced when they actually need to be cut down. I actually, and I, I felt really comfortable myself with the plan that we, we were shown, not knowing what, you know, that you had sent us, it felt like between replacing those trees when they come down, maybe even with a couple more trees, because those are, are big, older trees, and then the plan that we were sent on uh, today feel, feels feels good to me, um, but I don't know. Is there someone from the tree committee that could speak to this plan that they sent that's online? Yeah, I'm getting them. It'd be great if we could work it out right now. Yeah, well, I think we should. I don't think it's fair to the applicants if this holds them up. I have another. Molly, go ahead. You're unmuted. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, there, the head, you know, Shep Evans, the conservation chief, and Mike Peretti, the tree warden, are two members of our committee, and they have they proposed a number of ideas that we expressed in our letter, and I feel that I'm reasonable, and everybody else on the committee is reasonable, and I really was heartened by. Um, the two mats um, agreeing at the beginning of this discussion to work with us and maybe benefit from some of our expertise as well. I don't feel that we're going to be holding anybody up, but they were the ones that said they didn't feel comfortable dealing with this at this time because there wasn't enough time to do it. So I would be very... Uh, the issue with the dead trees is something that we need to talk about. It's possible that some of those trees in the front are actually on town property. Um, I don't think it's going to cost a lot of money, but I do think it's important to uphold the bylaw as you know, closely as we can. And they seem very reasonable about that. We didn't know about the trees in the back, but that certainly would count towards the total. We're happy to work this out tonight. Okay. Um, I have a question. You have the two pin oaks um, in front of the parking area, pretty much behind the stone walls. Is there any reason you couldn't put, say, like a uh, red maple or something that doesn't grow quite as high behind the fence, maybe one or two? I think they're calling for three, three trees behind the fence. Yes, but I'm, would you be willing to put one or two? Yes. So, so my question is, um, so the tree committee has submitted these plans and uh, like Holly said, I mean, if I'm feeling that, you know, with the master plan and expertise that the tree committee brings to this, I feel that, you know, to, to have them, um, you know, guide us and also guide this uh, project, what might be a good thing for the long term. So as Holly said, I mean, I don't think it's going to delay things that much. I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. So I, I feel that, you know, there might be a, a point that, you know, it's not going to hold up the project, but we could still get the expertise of, of the tree committee. So, I mean, I'd, I'd really like to, to see that um, recognized. If we're willing, and I'm not willing to give up our authority to any committee, because what ends up happening, and this is in personal the tree committee, is if it does hold it up, because they have to post meetings, they have to post site visits and everything else. We've given up our authority as special permit granting authority. Could we just go with the tree plan then? Uh, of what I'm hearing from Matt and Matt, that's not totally acceptable because they haven't had time to look at it. You know, I would be comfortable if they put in two trees behind the fence. I think that would be enough. I'd be comfortable with that in addition to what they presented to us. Um, do we know, um, Matt, Matt and Matt, how many trees are going up in the back? Um, at least four. At least four sycamores along the rear um, wetland boundary. Um, uh, I'd have to double check some of the other details, but I know there's at least four at the rear. Would you mind doing that really quickly? 
Sure. Bear with me just a sec. I'm trying to do it yeah. right now as, as we speak. Yeah, no problem. Because right now I'm seeing four, just four new trees in front, and that would be the four sycamores in the back. There's the four existing trees that we would ask to have replaced. So that gets us to 12 trees of the 17 that would have been required. Correct. Um, and then there, I think there's some dogwoods as well. Well, uh, the dogwoods actually, I believe, are in the, um, the, as I recall now, in the front parking right. area. Right. That's rain what I gardens. see. With and the river birches. We were going to do some rain gardens in the front garden, in the front parking area. Right. Those are not shade trees, so I think they're called specifically for shade trees. So it's, it's just four at the rear. Just the four at the rear. Correct. I think we're pretty close. I think that's twelve. That's twelve trees right there. If we did the two small maple trees that Bill asked, that's fourteen mm -hmm. of the seventeen trees. In, if that I feels could, very reasonable to me. In in back to what you pointed out, the river birches in those um, parking lot area, they are on the list of trees for recommended planting, unless I'm mistaken. They are. Okay, I just I just. I know they're not in the um, front setback, which I think right. is the, the preferred location, but they are so with, uh, they are just off to the back of the um, that main landscaped island. So, they're, so they're, the two maples that Bill suggested and those three river birch, that gets us 17 trees, which is what was asked for. I, I think that's correct. So, so Holly, what are the trees? Are we talking about the road frontage trees that are, are differing from what... Um, is being proposed. I mean, what trees are, are not there that? Well, well, what we wanted to do was to give as much shade as possible, and un we understood that the sign and the vision of the of the building was important. So that's why we tried to ask, or we asked, suggested more trees in front of the house. There's two trees there, and it's slightly set back that are going to be taken down anyway for the parking. And then there's a bunch of trees of which really only one, according to Mike Peretti, is, is really healthy. And then as you go across the driveway, there's sort of some scuzzy, there's sort of weedy trees there. And then two more dead trees that are probably, that are set back a little bit. So we were hoping for a nice, you know, arched tree line shady area in that without having to do a lot. The trees that we suggested for behind the fence, in addition to the pin oaks that it were, they had suggested, were just flowering cherries. These are like eight, 10 feet tall. It's like the trees along the bank where, um, where the um, woman that does the perfume, <laughs> I mean the cosmetics along that school street there. There's a bunch of little, pretty little trees. Um, and that's, that we thought would be also just to give it more of a green feeling. We are, I understand why you don't want to give control to us. I understand that completely. But I do feel that the quid pro quo that we suggested, that if the, if the total wasn't met, was, is an important precedent. Well, I mean, I, I guess I, I agree that, you know, we should be following a precedent. And um, I would like to see, Matt, there's a way to put some more shade trees in the front. I know that you're uh, hesitant about committing to something, but I feel that we should at least honor that part of um, the chief committee's plan. Is that something that you're able to? So I see on the recommended tree list, they have sizes, large, medium, and small. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would lean towards a medium or small tree in that front main island. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's along the lines of what the Holly was thinking in, in, in Mr. Cook. I yes. think she was talking about in front of the, the building. Was that true? No, that was behind the fence on the island. Okay. That's what, I, that's what I'm, I agree that's the same location. I just want to make sure if we went with a medium or small tree that comes from the list, does that satisfy? Yes. Um, it does. Okay. I'd be good with that. Does somebody want to put that into words? <laughs> are, we, are we there to put it into words? I think our public hearing well, went... The other oh, thing we close the public hearing, but okay. So, so what is a medium to small tree as opposed to large tree? I mean, what are we talking? So they list um, three types of birches: uh, a hornbeam, a cherry, and a crab apple for medium trees. A dogwood, a holly, and a witch hazel for small trees. So it gives us about seven or eight to choose from. Yeah. Oh. 
That could nice. be really nice. So tree. I would be comfortable with medium trees. Okay. So are we there to close the public hearing and have Ed make a motion? Uh, somebody else is going to have to make this tree part of the um, condition, but I'm if somebody thinks they can do that, I'm ready to close the public hearing. I, 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 this is Chris. I don't know where you are with the trees on the property just to the south. No, yes. somebody, somebody may, I, may, I take, may I take a gander? I think I know where we are. Okay. <laughs> I think we're going with the plan that Guido's sent to us. Um, or that Chris forwarded to us, plus two additional small to medium shade trees behind the fence in that center island and replacing the four trees that are in front of the house when the time comes. Is that... Could I correct the... Just, there's just one correction I see. Yes. Three small to medium trees behind the fence on the island. It's two small shade trees. But the small and the medium trees are not really shade trees. I, I guess it's just a difference between what Bill said and what the tree committee said, because I think Bill said he would be okay with two. Um, two. Two is a nice number, but but multiples in gardening, maybe you have this theory too. Things look better when they're in groupings of three than they do in yeah. twos or even numbers. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of room there. What do you say? Three? <laughs> so I would ask for three shade trees, medium. So what's the total? I think then they're, then they're planting more than the 17 that we that was required to, for them to begin with. So that That's feels cool. like they, we've got them to 18 trees, and that feels a little like we you know, we're, co we're costing them, I don't know. In my mind, I mean, I do understand that three looks better. I mean, there is a river birch right there in the middle that's going to be right at the beginning of that parking row. And a red dogwood and a winterberry, which probably fall into that small size. I, don't, I mean, I guess this is something we can, we can hash out when we close it and, and do our findings or our final motion, but it seems like we at least have some idea. The thing you just said, Kate, that's eight, that adds up to 18 trees? I lost count. I believe so. There's the four in the back that they're planting, the four sycamores in the back. There's the four... Um, pin oaks. Pin oak. There's the four pin oaks that they're planting along the fence. That's eight. There's the four existing trees that are there, um, which would be replaced. Those river birches count as shade trees. Is that correct? No. Twelve. Okay. They do not. Okay. Also, so that's the, twelve. And then. At, at the moment, there's only two trees on that island behind us. Right, but there's two on the next island down. Okay. Right. But, that, but that's not frontage. Yeah, well, we're talking frontage. Setback. Yeah, we're talking frontage. And those are shrubby rather than tree. -y. The, pin, the pin oaks are shrubby rather than tree. No, no, the ones in the parking lot itself in those little okay. gardens. How about just one more pin oak behind the fence? Then you got three. Okay. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, it's fine with. We're good with that. We can always add more trees. They can do it if they feel like things are lopsided. Even though right. it does cost money, it will look beautiful. Hey, can, do we, can, can we put this into some sort of a motion? The oh, trees need help, but I would go with with the, um, the Guido's proposal with the addition of one additional pin oak in the middle of the fence. Between the other two, Can that do it. Well, what are we missing, tree committee? If we do that, we're only missing some trees behind the fence, which were more for looks than for shade anyway, which is okay with me. As right. long as the trees in front of the house are replaced sooner rather than later. I mean, they are really, there's quite a bit of dead wood on some of those trees. So and we'll put that into the motion that they'll be replaced as soon as they start to show that they need to come down. When they become dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous. Hazardous. Okay. I'm I think okay. We're, we're there. Are we there with everyone? The Guido group is fine with that. Okay. okay. I just don't want to see... 
anyone have to vote no because of a tree. Right. So <laughs> this is a good plan. It's a good business. So I want to make right. sure that we do this right. Okay. So do I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Oh, second. Okay. Roll call vote. Lee. Aye. Kate. Aye. Bill. Aye. Ed. Aye. And aye. It's unanimous. Ed, you want a shot at the motion for findings? Um, Libby, yeah, I'm going to need help at some point. Um, so move to accept the findings with the proposed conditions. One, as existing and proposed new trees age and or decline, they shall be replaced as often and as soon as practicable in order to maintain the landscaping as per plans. Two, prior issuance of final certificate of occupancy for the expanded store. Applicants shall submit a proposal indicating proposed lighting hours of the parking lots such that exterior building and parking lot lights are turned off or substantially dim when the store is not in operation. And that's all existing in, in what we have in front of us. And three, we accept the current plan with the, the current tree planting plan proposed by Guidos with the addition of one in oak. In oak. In oak. In the middle of the fence. Where he said. Behind the fence, you know. Yep. I'll second that. So I have a motion and a second. Discussion. Seeing no discussion, roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I, it's unanimous. Ed, a motion for approval. In view of the approved findings of fact to approve special permit 911-20 with the conditions as noted in the approved minutes. And second. Any discussion by the board? Hearing none, it's a roll call, of course. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And, and I. It's unanimous, and good luck, Matt and Matt. Thank you, board. Thank you very much, you guys. Appreciate all your help. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Matt. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, next we have a special permit application, a continuation from Berkshire Aviation Enterprises for an aviation field in an R4 zone. At 70 Acre Mount Plain Road, preparing for sections 3.1.4 E1 and 10.4 of the zoning bylaw. So, a motion to reopen the public hearing. So moved. And second. Roll, roll call. And Kate is recused from this. So, Lee? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I. So, let me go over some of the ground rules tonight. It is now 7 o'clock. We will, I will first ask for the applicants to any short, brief statements um, from the last time, maybe things that have come up that they want to um, expound on just slightly. Then we will take um, for people to speak in favor or opposition. I'm going to do that for one hour. If everyone doesn't get to speak, we will continue until the next select board meeting but we will go for one hour of comments don't feel that you have to use up the whole hour but uh, i will let you do that um to repeat it's the people who can speak in favor of opposition to our residents of great barrington or who's a tonic only the speaking is can speak for three minutes there are two people who i've given extended time to and that will be it for this whole public hearing not just tonight Claudia Shapiro has asked for, and I will give her and Tad Hewer, who are who is representing three of the neighbors, I believe, um, a total of five minutes each. Everyone else will have three minutes, and there will be no other exceptions to that. So first, let me open up with um, Jim Scalise, as soon as I find him. And Mark, feel free to help with this. Got a hand up. I'm looking as well. I'm not seeing the hands up. This is going to be a problem tonight. For some reason, I'm not seeing the hands up. Okay, there it is. Fine. Jim? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good evening for your record, um, and I'll be brief, understanding the uh, agenda now. 
Um, uh, Jim Scalise on behalf of Berkshire Aviation Enterprises. I also have Dennis Egan and other members of the team and the applicant all on the call if there are specific questions. But in a very brief summary, since the last meeting, we were asked to respond uh, to questions. We re I responded to approximately 17 topics of clarification and submitted that uh, last week. We have submitted a, a bio information, a, a biography information on the management team. Uh, we have uh, a response letter was prepared to what I'll call the Foley and Hogue letter uh, that was submitted previously. So we've submitted all that information to the town since your last meeting. Um, some of the clarification, again, uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. We, we have 48 aircraft on site, 23 in hangars, 25 on grass. The goal is, is to create 33 new spaces inside uh, hangar, hangars. There'll be 27 on-site aircraft, some from the existing hangar and some from grass, which leaves six additional spaces for new resident customers, which are all existing customers, but don't uh, their planes don't uh, stay on site for a total of 54 aircraft on site, which is exactly consistent with the 2020 forecast by Mass DOT projecting a less than 1% growth rate since 2010 for this airport. So what we're, we're not suggesting explosive growth, we're not ex suggesting or requesting permission to expand the airport. Uh, we're, we're requesting the ability to park existing customers at a, uh, a forecasted growth rate that goes back a decade uh, at this location to make the airport uh, improve its business model and make it more sustainable. Uh, I went through many topics, as I said, very briefly. Uh, water and wastewater, we have a well test. We have non-detect on any lead in it. We have it as a satisfactory, uh, and these are all in my professional opinion, a uh, satisfactory septic field for the proposed use. 50% uh, of our aircraft use unleaded fuel. Uh, all hazardous materials, which includes fuel and waste oil, are all recycled on site. Uh, we have updated traffic data from Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, which gave us hourly counts. Uh, bottom line is we have one to two cars per hour. During the peak hour, you might see three cars, one car every 20 minutes at the two curb cuts, which generally splits the traffic evenly. Uh, current traffic on the neighboring roadways is much lower than the level of service allows and will never exceed that in any estimation. Uh, so the level of service, whether we build this or not, will not change. We provided updated view sheds, building elevations, floor plans. We looked at cuts and fills for the planning board. I submitted a copy of our Natural Heritage Endangered Species letter, which says that we're near but not within the habitat, so we're not in jurisdiction. I submitted a lead test for six surficial soil samples. Uh, they all came back in what our opinion as background level, so there's no elevated levels of lead. The highest level we have on site is 21.7 parts per million. The state's S1 threshold, which is in the most sensitive of areas, is 200 uh, parts per million for a reportable concentration. So we're, we're uh, many times less than uh, the lead concentrations for a level that is considered uh, um, reportable. We believe it's naturally occurring lead in the, uh, in the on-site soils that was detected. Uh, there was also a tank test. And the reason I submitted that was just to establish, I know there's concerns about the aquifer, but there's no source on site. There's no mishandling of hazardous material. There's no leaking tanks. And there's no lead in our soil. Uh, there's no lead in our groundwater. So we don't have a source of contamination on site. And we're not proposing any increase in maintenance activities on site as part of this application. Um, and everything I'm promising, we're willing to accept in a condition. Um, lastly, the plans were updated. We added two drawings. Uh, we added a... Um, uh, erosion control plan. Uh, we added the lighting plan into the drawing set. It was previously an exhibit in the booklet. Now it's in the drawing set. Hopefully that clears up some confusion. We got a little more specific about some landscaping. We show silt fence, tracking pads, some erosion control notes. And the lighting plan, again, shows that the nearest light uh, at 0.5 foot candles is at least 350 feet from the nearest property line. So this project has a full cutoff light style fixture as requested by the planning board now, and it's uh, it's not in any proximity to any property lines. That summarizes what we've done. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So I'm going to start with the two people who have asked for extended time or have I've given extended time to, Tad Hewer, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Are you there?
He does have a handbook. Yeah. yeah I have them right here, too. Okay. Tad, there you are. Hello, and thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tad Hewer on behalf of uh, three residents of uh, the town, Holly Hamer, Mark Fasto, and Ann Fredericks, who are at 99 and 77 Seacon Cross Road, respectively. Um, as you've seen from our letter, and I will attempt to be brief because um, we have, don't want to reiterate what you said there, uh, they do urge that the application be denied because it simply doesn't meet the stringent legal standards for the grant of a special permit. Um, one, one brief word on the application materials. And setting aside whether the materials <clears throat> meet the minimum requirements, uh, there's a substantive reason the procedure matters here. And I'd point to the fact that the bylaw requires a submission to show all proposed structures. Uh, the original application didn't include elevations. Uh, the applicant told the planning board there was a tiny schematic on page 20. You can all look at it in your um, documents. That schematic suggests the hangars would be at most 16 and a half feet tall. Now they've finally submitted elevations. And it turns out the hangars are 36% taller. They're 22 and a half feet tall. Uh, so despite the airport having submitted the application on April 20th, residents have been misinformed about the scale of the project for four months. So you can understand why it's difficult for residents to know which version of the story to rely on when the information being provided by the airport shifts. So turning to the merits, you know the two, the main legal standard, which is that you need to find that the adverse effects won't outweigh the potential beneficial impacts after you look at the six criteria. But the second one is also important, that under state law, it's the airport's burden to prove that it's entitled to a special permit. So put differently, the default is that special permit is to be denied, not that it's to be granted. It's literally a special permit. So looking briefly at these six items, um, the six criteria, on social, economic, and community needs, uh, Mr. Egan's recent letter in response to mine uh, suggests that, quote, the need criterion has been met since the use already exists. Uh, I would note that that's a non sequitur. Uh, under that logic, any pre-existing non-conforming use, uh, whether it's um, a airport or um, you know, a hog farm, uh, would per se meet the need criterion. If that logic doesn't sound right to you, then you're right. Uh, need is based on need, regardless of whether it's pre-existing non-conforming or not. Uh, and the airport hasn't shown that it has a need, just a, a private want, and that's just not enough under the bylaw. Um, as to economic need, the airport wants to have it both ways. Um, the application asserts that the permit should be granted because there won't be adverse impacts, because there won't be any growth in airport use. Uh, but the application also asserts that it meets the economic need criteria because the airport will drive tourism and generate new job opportunities and bring in additional customers. Both can't be true. Um, turning to the question of financial, financial impact, because I think that's a relevant one. Now I'm going to move it up because I know it's the last criteria. At the last meeting, the select board expressly asked the airport to provide fiscal impact data and tax data. Uh, the supplement doesn't contain that information, nor does Mr. Egan's letter. And the omission is troubling because if you look at the data, it's not clear that there will be much of a tax benefit. Um, it's not just that the airport focused on the gross fiscal impact, not the net fiscal impact, which needs to factor in the fact that residential property values will decrease uh, due to the impact of visual hangers, the visual impact of the hangers plus increased noise and nuisance. It's that even if the hangars do increase the value by $2 million, which is what the airport claims, at our current rate, it's 15.75 on 1,000, uh, that generates only about $30,000 in revenue. And that's only if they're assessed as if they're residential property, the commercial property in Massachusetts is usually assessed on an income basis. So if they don't generate enough income, they don't generate property tax revenue for the town. The other main point I want to talk about is neighborhood character. Uh, the neighborhood's central argument is that its 87-acre property constitutes most of the neighborhood. Uh, for context, a one-mile circle is about 2,000 acres. All the land in a one-mile circle around the airport is R2 or R4. It's residential. But instead of acknowledging that there are significant residential impacts, uh, the airport repeatedly argues that the neighborhood has grown up around the airport. But again, the hard numbers show otherwise. I looked at every assessor property card for every house on West Plain, Pumpkin Hollow, Seacon Cross, and Egremont Plain that's in the vicinity of the airport. That's 34 houses. 18 of them were constructed before 1930. And the average age, they were built in 1867. And that just counts the houses that are still there, not the ones where there's been a tear down and it's been rebuilt upon, even though the lot stayed in residential use. So quite frankly, the, the airport's preferred narrative just isn't true. That the airport is the more recent addition to a long-standing residential neighborhood, not the other way around. On issues of noise and lighting, I think it's very clear. Uh, you've seen that the airport hasn't really addressed noise at all in their application. They told the planning board that uh, they had a noise mitigation policy, but they found it difficult to enforce their pilots. 
um, that's kind of an admission of being unable to manage unreasonable noise. It's a reason to deny a special permit, not to place the impacts of routine noncompliance or someone else's convenience on the surrounding residents. Now on the issue of lighting, let's be frank. Commercial industrial grade flood lighting is fundamentally incompatible with a residential neighborhood. Swapping one type of commercial flood light up for another, which is what they proposed, uh, isn't the right question. It's the question of what level of insurance of lighting should a residential neighborhood be forced to accept um, versus whether commercial industrial flood lighting is necessary to any use that's in a residential neighborhood in the first place. You've seen in our application letter, and I'll conclude, um, or in our response letter, we have issues about the natural environment. Um, we have concerns about the storage compartments of the hangars. Uh, you heard last week from the applicant that they wouldn't be storing any hazardous materials in the hangars. Uh, page one of their new supplement says the opposite. It says, quote, the new hangars will be supplied with a fuel barrel to collect waste or contaminated fuel. Again, it's just hard to know which version of the airport's story to believe. And finally, I think there one last thing I'd like to point out, separate from the six conditions, or the six criteria, is section 7.2. Um, section 7.2 does have an exception for structures. But it's critical to remember here, the airport is asking for a special permit that goes beyond the hangar structures. It says right in the cover letter, they quote, wish to permit the existing non-conforming use at the property and that it also includes construction of new hangars. Section 7.2 undoubtedly applies here. It's not just the hangars that are at issue, it's the airport use and that's a 7.2 issue. So for all these reasons, the neighbors urge the board to deny the permit. Uh, again, the burden is on the airport to demonstrate that it should be granted and neither the application nor the proposal meet those standards required for the board to make that fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, we do not see Claudia on the line. We're trying to establish contact with her, so I will move ahead. Um, um, yes. Uh, she Very likely she might be on a phone. You want to tell her how to raise her hand on a phone? She wasn't. She had her name. It would be star nine to raise your hand. I didn't know she was on. She was on earlier. And it, so, so Jay Fingeroff, I will let you speak next. Name and address, please. Thank you. Um, James and Patricia Fingeroff, 130 Herbert Road in Great Barrington. Uh, thank you. Yeah, go right ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have lived uh, in this area and on this property for over 40 years, and we are well aware of the airport and its presence. Um, we are greatly concerned, though, about what appears in our case to be a uh, significant increase in the frequency of flights in the different types of aircraft that seem to be coming in and out of the airport, in the noise that those aircraft are making, in the height at which they are flying, and in the flight path that they take all of which individually and cumulatively, in our view, have become increasingly disruptive and increasingly ignoring the concerns and the needs of the residential neighbors around the airport. Um, we see this, unfortunately, virtually every day and including uh, especially, of course, on weekends. Uh, we noted in a story actually in the Eagle yesterday or today, it was both that uh, Messrs. Uh, Solon have acknowledged that and admitted that basically the uh, factors that I just mentioned have in fact increased and expanded. And while they uh, seem to regret it and have made excuses for why it's happening, have not apparently made any attempts to ameliorate any of that other than to say, if you are at any point disturbed, please call one of us and tell us about it but there's no indication that they plan to do anything about it other than to kind of be pleasant and make nice, if you will. We are also concerned that the uh, presence of the hangars will or could very easily result in the expansion of the airport, an expansion of the number of planes that are stored there or fly in and out. Um, moving the planes that are currently on the outdoors in the, on the ground into hangars would in fact perhaps open the airport to be able to accommodate a larger number of planes, which could take the place of those that are currently not in hangars. Uh, to us, this just seems like a kind of a creeping expansion and using this as in a way or a vehicle through which to do that. 
Uh, a few years ago, maybe more than just a few, uh, we recall vividly that the airport uh, decided to become host to a glider club. I think it was a glider club out of Canaan, Connecticut, and uh, in fact did so for some time until those of us in the area became so enraged by it and we brought enough pressure that the airport basically decided it was not in its own interest to have to put up with the aggravation. Gliders, or at least their tow planes, are exponentially even louder than the planes that we normally hear and see here. Uh, I think that's another example of the airport doing what it may see is in the interest of itself and its customers or clients, but not really caring very much for those uh, of the residents of the area. And so for all of those reasons, we think that this is just something that is ill-conceived and would be contrary to the interests of the people in the surrounding area and maybe even beyond in Great Barrington. Thank you very much. Okay, next one is, let me just find it here, E. Windman, and you'll tell me how to pronounce it when I, go ahead. Yeah, it's Claudia Shapiro, Ed. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't Good. let GB do to the Green River what GE did to the Housatonic. I request a statement be read and incorporated into the record of proceedings. As a professional civil engineer, surveyor, and land planner, your application is dimensionless, and your plans all state in the legend approximate property lines speaks volumes. It coincides with all the original deeds dating back to 1929 depicting the history of Berkshire Aviation being removed from the registry of deeds. There was a March 2017 four-page special permit for Berkshire Aviation Enterprise, but no deed for the parcel known as 70 Egremont Plain Road, the airport. So Berkshire Aviation already has a special permit. A Walter J. Kalazda Airport has been added to the Registry of Deeds and backdated to 1967 that also has no deed. The date of Walter J. Kalazda Airport does not exist, and the special permit application is seeking to do just that. I am no businessman, but the town and the airport have spent 12 years and a lot of money for what? To erect six aircraft storage hangars with space for 36 planes to the tune of $2 million? Mr. Scalise stated at the July 23rd planning board hearing had five spaces spoken for. The special permit application appears to be for hangars for aircraft storage, but the paperwork in the plan depict what appears to me to be a recycling plant. The special permit application states the KGBR, Colossal Great Barrington Regional Airport, has a recycling plan, but no plan is included. The state of Massachusetts lists hazardous waste generators as the airport of a small quantity generator of waste oil. The special permit application states the airport is currently in compliance with the United States Environmental Protection Agency requirements for storing and handling very small quantities of hazardous waste. And I am stating for the record that there is only one state compliant very small quantity generator of hazardous waste in the Water Quality Protection Overlay District, and it is me. I am the Federal Resource Conservation Recovery Act that promotes community source reduction and beneficial reuse and is what this development plan is built on. In 2010, the airport landed in the Massachusetts Statewide Airport System Plan and had to disclose that they had a recycling plan and a comprehensive solid waste management plan. The special permit application has a Section 2.0 Operations and Maintenance Plan that states prepared under the direction of a professional engineer, but the page is blank. There is no plan. Operations and maintenance plan of what? Aircraft storage hangars under the direction of a professional engineer? There's an illicit discharge statement that states the stormwater and sanitary sewer system prepared for the Great Barrington Airport. Mr. Scalise stated the airport has adequate septic. A stormwater pollution prevention plan is a site-specific written document signed by a company executive that identifies all activities and conditions at the site that could cause pollution. A stormwater pollution prevention plan is a required step for facilities seeking to obtain a national discharge pollution elimination system permit. What facility? These are hangars to store aircraft. A national pollution discharge elimination system permit is required if you discharge pollutants into a municipal stormwater system. Discharge into a municipal stormwater system requiring a pollution discharge permit include incinerator ash, solid waste, any type of municipal and industrial waste, sewer sludge, hazardous waste, chemical waste and garbage. 
There are provisions in the zoning bylaw section 9.2 water quality protection overlay district for a recycling program. Provisions added in 2010 that include a solid waste combustion facility and handling facilities, household hazardous waste centers, etc. Five hangers each with office space, one for glass, one for paper, one for metal, one for plastic, and one for the garbage. And the sixth hanger is the facility as in combustion to burn the garbage. The aircraft storage hangers are going as stated in the application on North Plain Road. A recycling plant will generate direct monetary compensation for the town. Abutting communities will bring their garbage here to the aquifer. And a politi political attack spanning 17 years, the town, airport, and neighbors have been strategically planning this development, knowing it requires my property while strategically excluding me from the process. What you claim vocally, Mr. Scalise, is contrary to the contents of your application. Let us revisit the registry of deeds and get a deed recorded for this parcel and not for your mass DOT identification number 1142 and station name Sean. The town is on notice. Any attempt to permit this airport at that, this point in lieu of my extensive documentation constitutes a premeditated illegal taking, land taking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. Okay. So next, anyone else want to put their hand up? Okay. Ellen House. Ellen, just unmute yourself. Sorry about that. It's going, it's going to be not myself, but my husband, Jeffrey, speaking. Okay, just name and address, please. Uh, Jeffrey House, 99 Herbert Road. Thank you. Uh, um, so, what concerns me is when you issue this special permit to the airport, does, does it then be, does it, do they then become, um, uh, they can do whatever they want after that special, special permit, or do they always have to come back to you to get another special permit to do something else? Um, it's kind of a open-ended question. This will allow them to be a airport in the eyes of our bylaws or the special permit. They will not have to come back for other special permits. Chris, do you want to try to answer that or, or Mark? Uh, this is Chris Rembold. Uh, yep. Thanks, Steve. It, it really depends on if the board issues a special permit and what conditions they put on it. They could ask the airport to come back as much as you want or not at all. So it's a, it is, as you say, a very open-ended question. It will depend entirely on the details of the permit that you issue if you do issue a permit. Okay, so, so then... So I assume that everybody that the board has read the Mass DOT Aeronautics Division uh, um, report that they put out. Has anybody, have you, people read that? That whole document? This is more time for you to give comments than for us. Well, to I'm just, I'm, well, I want to know, I want to know where you you guys, I mean, I assume everybody assumes things, and I'm just assuming that you've looked at that the um, the the statewide airport system plan. I uh, you've looked at that, right? I have. What? Yes, I have. Yeah. So then, so then, there are a lot of things in that airport system plan that indicate what they want to do at the airport, as far as and one one of them is that they need hangers. OK. And the other thing is that the airport, since it's privately owned, it's there's three airports in the state of Massachusetts that are privately owned. So um, being privately owned, they they are not able to access any federal funding, state or federal funding to do anything that they want to do to to improve the airport. So that would mean that, um, let's say, and if you can hear the airport taking off, a plane taking off right now in my yard here, um, that would mean that 
that the uh, Berkshire Aviation or uh, Walter Colasa Airport can't access any federal funds unless they actually or get someone, an investor to say invest in the airport unless they can jump through these couple of hoops for the town to issue them a permit for just three inconspicuous um, hangers that they want to put down there. Once you've done that, that kind of, to me, it kind of it opens the door a crack where a well-skilled lawyer can probably put his foot in there and a bunch of flies can fly in through the, through the door. And, that, and then we, as the citizens who live around the airport, might not have any recourse in controlling what they do at the airport because they, now they can move into the next steps. But right now, because he is a privately owned airport, he can't access any of the funds, state or federal funds, to do anything there. Okay? Um, and, and also, too, is if this does happen and they do move forward and the next thing you know that the FAA gets involved in the whole thing, which they are a little bit, but the, um, and the um, airport, anybody who does any construction around the airport would literally have to file um, building permits and what they're going to do with the FAA, along with the local building codes. So it's, it, this is like, this is something that needs to be like put, like the, the, the select board, the planning board, this is an important thing that's gonna happen in our town. And we really need to, to, to slow it down and do our homework and research and see what exactly they wanna do with this airport. Because once the door is open, when you give them that permit, some lawyer will be able to pick through that after you've, after you've acknowledged that they are a, an airport. Right now, they're not a really an airport. They shouldn't be there. I don't know how they get a bill. They haven't done one thing at that airport. I've lived here for 60 years. They, the only thing that they've done there is basically put a new uh, gas tank in there. They have, they have never put up another new building, nothing. And that is probably because they could never get a building permit to do anything for, since that airport existed. And Walter, your, your time Walter, is just about up. Just wrap it up. Please. Okay. Well, I, I mean, these are the things that I'm, you know, I'm expecting you people to do your homework, I, you know, on, the, on this airport. And, and there's a lot of residents that, you know, if you live within, I live within, uh, you know, a mile of the airport, the people that live 10 miles away, they could care less what goes on at the airport. So it, it does impact people within a mile or two of the airport very heavily. Thank you very much. Can I just add one thing? Have all you select board people come to the residents of the surrounding areas and sat down with them on a Saturday or a Sunday when we all work really hard all week all week long, and then Saturday and Sunday come along, and we have to listen to the airplanes taking off and landing all day Saturday and Sunday. I would invite you to my house anytime, down to the Green River, anytime. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one else, we're not going to close the public hearing. We'll start, oh, I have a hand up. I would ask you to put your hand up ahead of time so I can judge how many people want to speak. Not to, not to wait, please. Doug Stewart. Just unmute yourself, please. Yeah, Doug, go ahead. You are unmuted. Doug, if you can hear me, you are totally unmuted, so. Now you're muted. 
Okay, I will move on. Does anyone else want to speak? We're not closing the public hearing tonight, so. Doug, if you can get yourself unmuted, I will let you speak. I, I see you raise your hand, but you have to unmute yourself. Okay, does anyone on the board have any questions? I have a question. Yes. I've been trying to get some sort of answer as to what the increase in the taxes would be. Both in, Do they pay excise taxes on the planes that are popped? Uh, left on the property. I can't imagine they do unless they live in Great Barrington. It seems like there's not a lot of additional revenue. If we're talking $30,000 a year, that doesn't seem like uh, much money for what's going on there. Jim Scalise, do you want to answer that? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I did a uh, quick spreadsheet today. I am not a, a tax expert, but I do own commercial real estate and I'm fairly familiar with how it works. And I have a construction cost estimate generally for the project. So if you run through those numbers, that 30000 additional or a total of forty five dollars to $50,000 in tax revenue is, is probably what you're going to get. You're going to get some land that's currently in, I think it's Chapter 61, uh, land would have to be removed. So there's a five-year retroactive uh, a cost that would be given to the town. So those would be the direct real estate um, costs. I think if uh, vehicles are stored, um, I can tell you that uh, owning a small business with several vehicles, vehicles stored at my location pay excise tax in that town. So I think there is an excise tax uh, for the, the aircraft. So, but you know what we're promising here. And I, I use that word uh, uh, because uh, we're talking about following the growth rate that's set forth in that mass DOT uh, uh, forecast, which is, you know, if you place the condition on this project that their growth rate has to be 1% consistent or 0.9% consistent with that uh, study, then uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're projecting. Um, we're, so we're not projecting explosive growth, um, but uh, so... You know, it's, it's a double-edged uh, question. You know, yeah, it's going to generate some, I think it's going to double, practically double the tax revenue at this location. I think that's significant. I think it's going to add excise tax. I think it's going to add some jobs. Uh, uh, it's, so that's true, but it's not really increasing the overall activity that much. You're right. So, um, um, you know, I know that uh, folks are going to take things I say out of context, so that's uh, difficult, but... Uh, you know, the thing like the NIPTES question, there's a construction-related erosion permit that's required. There's no discharge. Uh, to answer the gentleman's question about additional work, we have an exemption for hangers. This is our master plan. You want to condition us that if we want to build hangers beyond what's shown on this plan, we have to come back for a special permit? We're open to it. Uh, we would need a site plan review regardless for any large project. That's also in the bylaw. So this project doesn't go unregulated. There can't be changes beyond what we're really showing here without some level of review by the town. Um, and and if, if there isn't enough there to make folks comfortable, we're willing to accept conditions that make you comfortable. But thanks Dennis, for the Dennis, do you want to say something? Uh, yes, through, through the chair to Mr. Cook. I, I, I would just add uh, to Jim's comment, don't, don't take our word for it. I believe in the last hearing, uh, Mr. Cook suggested that he had reached out to the town assessor for an analysis uh, and you know I would suggest that rather than taking our word for it uh, which I don't suspect anyone who opposes the current the current will uh, the the assessor would be the would be the appropriate part party to get that information from but uh, mr. Scalise's point <clears throat> there is property at the airport that would be taken out of chapter 61a and there is a five-year retroactive uh, tax on that as well. And again, that would be something that the assessment field should like. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a number of hands raised now. We're not getting into a debate here. And I had already asked for citizens to raise their hand. You didn't. I will try this again. And then I'll go back to the board. Um, Vicki Wyndham. 
Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, Lee, you had asked um, last, I, I think it was the last meeting, to find out how many people that have airplanes at the airport are Great Barrington or Berkshire residents. Um, and do you have an answer to that? Because we'll find that, but we're not going into a debate here. We will I wasn't find going into the debate. No, I no, I'm just saying we will find an answer to that. I'm not completely okay. on the spot, and I don't think we've gotten an answer to that yet. So that okay, will go on our you. list. That's fine. That will go on our list. Michael Peretti. Um, yes, this is Julie Peretti at 125 Seacott Crossroad. Um, did anyone ever find out how many flight school um, participants there are? Um, that's, that's an interesting question. And, um, I, you know, as far as the taxes that the um, airport would bring in, I'm pretty sure there's um, a couple residents around this area that bring in double that amount in their taxes. And um, mine are quite high as well. So, um, and I don't find it to have any economic impact on our town whatsoever. Um, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, Twin Scalisi. Fuck. Which one? Who is that? Just seeing who else are their hand up. Thought Pat did. I did not put it down, so I don't see him on the line. Okay, board members, we already have a few questions. Are we prepared tonight to start to ask questions, or do you want to continue that? We're going to continue it anyways. We're not voting tonight. But do you want to save the questions for the next meeting? Uh, I, think, I think it's probably for me. I, I think I'd like to save my questions. Okay, so I see two of you already. So we'll make a motion to continue this, Ed, to September 14th. Six o'clock via Zoom. So moved. And second. Okay, it's a roll call vote. So it's Lee. Aye. Bill. Aye. Ed. Aye. And I. So it's unanimous. So we will continue this until September 14th. Um, I think we're getting closer, but we have a lot of questions that the board will be asking. Um, so we will, we will move ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. License or, or permits, the A and B, the American Art Marketing, which is A and B, has been withdrawn. Um, next is Justin Thompson for a driveway permit at 64 Castle Hill Avenue. Is there someone on the line? I'm not sure we need it, but just in case we want to ask questions. Yeah, I see a hand go up. Thank you. Brian? Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Brian Bordenero. I work at Clark and Green Architects. Okay. And I can try to field any questions about the driveway. Okay. We may not have any, but at least I want to make sure someone was on the line. Does okay. anyone have any questions? No. All the heads are shaking, so do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? It's a roll call vote. Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And I? It's unanimous. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank that you. was easy. <laughs> Next, we have new business, appointment of a member to the Conservation Commission. Do I have a motion? Motion to appoint Michael Lanou to the Conservation Commission. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And aye, it's unanimous. Mark, I think you or Chris on the next one, the water ban, single use bottle, um, extension of of this. Thanks, Steve. Uh, included in your packet tonight was an executive summary uh, on the water bottle ban. 
Retailers are currently permitted to sell water bottles one liter or less uh, until the end of this month. So at this point, I'm just looking for some guidance from the board on whether you'd like to extend uh, the lift on that ban or um, we'll put that back into effect on September 1st. My rationale, just so everyone knows it, to extend this is simply that well, there are actually two things. I'm not convinced that the water stations we have meet the requirements that should, they should be open, but that's beside the point because I know at the hospital they've closed their automatic filling machine just recently, so um, I would question that. But my larger discussion here is that every week we're talking about the Housatonic Water Company and water problems in Housatonic, and I think that we should have available to the citizens of Housatonic single-use water bottles until we have some sort of a solution to the problem up there. So I, I just think, I, to me, it seems like a little bit of a, a slap if we say, you can, in the town of Great Barrington, you can't buy single-use water bottles, and we have a good portion of our residents who don't have clean drinking water or clear drinking water. I know the state might tell us it's safe, but I wouldn't be drinking it. So, so Steve, um, I mean, we could be talking years, though. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about the replacement of, of rusty pipes. So when are we going to say enough is enough? You know, I, um, I understand your this, this sure will push us, Lee, to move faster on this, won't it? Yeah, but, I mean, I, it just seems like this is years of, of, you know, this is, we're looking at years, possibly. Yeah, this will not have that ban. At all. And if we don't, if we don't do it now, we're not going to do it. So, I mean, I, I would not um, favor that. I think that we should probably get back to what, what we've done because the longer we wait, then we're just kind of regressing as far as I, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm happy to accept the motion. It won't be the first thing I've lost or the last. So it's. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be, I'd be more inclined to give it another month. It seems that the brown water is worse in the summer when they're using more chlorine, they're getting more rust. I mean, to consider I, Obviously, there are other ways to get clean drinking water. I have Berkshire Mountain Springs deliver large bottles to my house. Um, you can get them filled at the grocery stores. I mean, not to say that people shouldn't have the ability. I mean, they should be getting it through their own pipes. But I just kind of to, to what Lee and, and Bill said, I, I think that we tend to, tend to see more of a problem in these summer months with the, the brown water. And, and if somebody's in the audience or Mark who lives in Housatonic can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd be more willing to give it another month than to give it till the end of November. Do you want to make that as a motion? Sure. Um, so what the current ban ends the end of August. Correct. So um, to, to extend the, I make a motion to extend the bottle the lifting of the bottle ban yes. through September 30th. Do I have a second? I'll second. Discussion. Yeah, the, the problem with that is it doesn't give retailers any notice. So the way Mark had set it up, there were to be 30 days notice. So if we go to at least 60 days from now, we can always give, if we meet, <coughs> we go oh. 30 days. otherwise they're sitting there with bottles they can't sell or they can't order them. Or do we say September 30th with a 30-day notice? So it's kind of set up in the... I guess I did in my mind I was thinking it was the same setup as what was written, just an earlier it's, date. Uh, it's September 30th is um, almost a month from... a little over a month from now. Right, so we went October 30th and decided by September 30th, or October 15th and decided by September 15th. Does that make sense? I just want to... I want us to be able to meet... 30 days, if, assuming it's us, it doesn't have to be, it's, it's so, according to bylaw Mark's call. I guess, I guess what I, I just want to ask to make sure that I'm clear, because this is where I'm getting lost, in what was handed to us, the November 30th, it was extending it to November 30th, right. with a 30-day warning, so does that mean that the 30-day warning would have come at November 30th, or the 30-day warning would have come November 1st? So we, would, we were going to meet October 26th and decide if it would end November 30th or we could extend another month. So should when we have a September 14th meeting and we have a September 28th meeting? That's correct. Can we, can we make a decision on September 
28th. About October? About October. I don't know. Right, or we could do September. Or we, say 30, or we say 30 days now. Yeah, if you say 30 days now, although I, everything I said is correct, say 30 days now, then it's really a hard ban because what we're telling merchants is don't buy any more water and sell what you have. Right. Yeah, I would be in favor of that. I think we should just, you know, give, give people a heads up. We have a lot of people online and give them a heads up as of tonight. That's so I have a motion to put the ban back into effect September 30th. Correct. Okay, yeah. I guess the only thing I would ask, um, just because Mark has gone down this road um, before, and he's certainly gone down this road with the plastic bag, what what kind of is easiest or feels better, or is, is there a route that is more, I don't know, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but just what would you recommend? So if you decide to proceed with September 30, if we can get a uh, notice out as early as tomorrow through our retailer list to advise them that they have 30 days to uh, sell off of stock and not to order anymore. Is that adequate for the retailers, do you think? Well, I will say uh, we, we, to a certain extent, gave them that notice the last time we extended it not to over purchase water bottles with the expectation that the bylaw would go back into full effect on September 1st. So in theory, if they listen to us the first time, they shouldn't have an abundance of water in stock at, at this point. So we have a motion and we have a second. <coughs> uh, vote Lee. No. No, this is for the ban on the 30th, just so everyone's clear. This for, for Kate's? Yes. Yeah, so I, I w I'd like to go with Mark's uh, recommendation, not Kate's adding the extra month. Is that correct? No. I didn't add the extra month. That was Ed. Okay, so is this going basically what, what Mark had just requested? This is Mark's. Yeah. Mark's. This is Kate's, which was September 30th. Would just, stop. You, when you say Mark's, you don't mean what he put in writing. You mean what he no. just said. What he just said. He's going to, we're going to 30 days from today or from tomorrow. Yes. Well, we'll it'll be September 30th, just to be clear. Yeah. That was the motion. So that's what I'm voting on. Okay, so then yeah. I retract that. Yes. Okay. Kate? Yes. Bill? Yes. Ed? No. And no, it passes by a three to two vote. Moving, moving ahead. Request to increase advertising fees due to the increased advertising costs. Steve, I'm going to ask that we pass over this item until Helen returns so that we can uh, put together an executive summary for the board. Okay, that's fine. Okay, last but not least is the approval, the review and approve the final draft of the 2020 special town meeting warrant articles. <coughs> and I just want to see, is Michael Wise on the line? He is not. Okay, I will. We'll touch base with them at some point because there was a question today. Mark, do you want to go through these? Sure. Uh, so in your packet, you received a 32-article draft warrant for the special town meeting on September 15th. Um, I did just want to mention this has not been reviewed or approved by council. We're expecting that final version any day now, but we don't expect many changes to do this either. Um, I'm happy to go through these one by one with you if you'd like, or if you'd like to just hand <laughs> fix uh, articles that you have questions on. Uh, I will just mention that uh, staff right now is working on a summary of these articles. So you'll uh, see that we'll have a 32 article warrant and also a 32 article explanation packet. And the goal here is to just boil down uh, some of these very complex matters, particularly zoning matters, uh, into a factual summary, somewhere between a sentence and a paragraph, uh, just so that people can um, really understand what they're reading if, if they have questions. And, you know, for those people that don't have the time to read through the entire uh, warrant, they'll have a summary in front of them at the town meeting on the 15th. The board, do you have, Mark is more than willing to go through all the articles, 
but I think it's probably just as clean if we have any questions. I think most of these we've read and been through uh, before, so we don't necessarily need. Um, hold on one second. Michelle, you have a question? Yes, I do, Steve. Uh, sorry, yep. Rob. Um, just to, because I'm a citizen petitioner, and from what I understand, there's going to be a little almost like a flip notes uh, on the war article. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay. Will the citizen petitioners be able to review the summary of their war article? I personally would like to see what's going to be written about the article that uh, my group has pulled together. Mark? I don't think we'll be summarizing the petition articles because I, I don't think uh, we want to risk misinterpreting the intention oh, of prior that. petitioners. I, thank you, Mark. I think that's a great idea. I appreciate it. Sorry, I should have clarified that. My, no, my that's apologies. okay. They, um, um, I just read this. I am released on that. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. So how does the board want to handle this? Do we just want to approve this? Do we have questions? I have no questions. I have one question. Sure. Sorry. Is Article 25, is that a bit by petition or was that written by the, it's on page 26 of that part of the warrant. That was by us. That was by us. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Any a other questions? Happen. A lot's happened. Yes, yeah. I understand. <laughs> I see no questions by the board, so I'm going to ask for a uh, motion to approve the final draft of the 2020 uh -huh. Special Town Meeting Warrant Articles. So moved. And second. Discussion? Hearing none, Lee? Aye. Kate? Aye. Bill? Aye. Ed? Aye. And aye. Thank you very much. We'll get a yep. final version together for you. Uh, remove this watermark uh, once it's reviewed by council and I'll reach out uh, when we need signatures. So thank you all. Thanks, Mark. Citizen speak time. Michelle, go ahead. I'm Michelle LeBaire, 70 Division Street. Uh, a couple of things. Um, with regard to Housatonic Water, uh, Mr. Pahensky mentioned how he invited uh, Nancy Stevens from the DPU to attend. And if it's possible, um, I'd like to have her, uh, I didn't quite catch what her position was at the DPU, and if I could obtain her email, that would be really helpful. Um, also, um, uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the chair um, for recognizing the Housatonic Water users. Um, you know, are having an issue, and the single-use water bottles are helpful, um, particularly during times when um, the lines are flushed. And I just want to correct the position of some board members that the boiling water only occurs during the hot weather, and as we all know, with global warming, hot weather, the summer season here in the bush is getting longer and longer. I distinctly remember attending a select board member, I think it was a meeting, I think it was in October 2016, where a young mother complained about the Royley water, and it was during a cold snap. So uh, that issue happens throughout the year, not just during uh, some, some of the weather. Um, also, um, I'm a little concerned as well with regard to the Cook's Garage matter that the town of Great Barrington shares an asset with someone, and we don't know who, who, who that is. Well, um, we, we know who it is, Michelle. Let's just, Chris didn't have the name off the top of his head. Okay. Um, and so I would like that information as well. Sure. Um, because I, I did some checking on the registry of deeds while the meeting was going on. And also with regard to the special town meeting, when will some details with regard to how the meeting will be, will look like September 15th. When will those be released? You have citizen petitioners on the sidelines right now wondering what will need to be done. And I'm one of them. And so I was just curious when there, perhaps Mr. Wise will be at a select board meeting and uh, can talk to that. Um, unless Mr. Kuhensky can offer some information at a future select board meeting. 
And um, that's about it. Okay. We'll, we'll probably have Michael if he's available at the next meeting. Okay. That would be great. And that, when's the next meeting? I'm sorry. September oh. 14th. Ah, that's cutting close. It's, it was really uh, it's, up. I'm not sure what you're looking for, Michelle, but I, I would say this. It's going to be set up the same as the previous two outdoor meetings. Okay. I certainly hope there will be someone charged with watching the forum uh, uh, of, of the meeting. Uh, I would suggest an email to Mr. Weiss because that's his uh, elected position. I don't, I don't duck off it, but this is one that is not ours. Steve, can I just add one? Yes. Uh, we are sourcing outdoor, well, additional, additional outdoor lights for the parking lot right now, so that um, that isn't a concern. I realize. Sorry. Thank you. Feedback. Feedback. Right. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Susie Paul. Susie, if you unmute yourself, you can go ahead. Sorry, um, okay. the, the little microphone icon um i needed to click a few things but um no problem um susie fowl 40 kirk street housatonic um and i first i didn't quite catch the i guess it was mark talking about the letter to the department of public utilities um am i understanding it right that you are waiting for the representative to join your meeting before you draft that letter or read that letter no no that, go ahead mark uh, i was just going to say that that letter went out on august 17th it's included in the board packet tonight which is on our website uh okay uh, and, and to answer michelle's question earlier uh the name of that individual is nancy stevens and her title is director consumer division massachusetts department of public utilities Okay. So, um, sorry, I don't have the packet, but I will look for that. Um, and I wondered if there's any room for some creative thinking in terms of, uh, I get that the Cook's Garage water source is not um, likely to be a, an official water source, but could there be, um, is there any way that there could be an outdoor tap for us to fill bottles on occasion? What, what's the, what's the, um, is the tap inside the building behind locked doors? It's inside the building behind locked doors. And, uh, if that tap were to serve more than 25 people per day for more than 60 days per year, that trips the threshold as it being a public water supply, which is, um, regulated by DEP. So I don't see that source of water being, uh, open to the public. Okay. So even if it were, if it, if it were plumbed so that there was an outdoor, like one of the filling stations that are being put around town, that's still, you think the demand would be too high if it were a filling station? I do. It, that's just my personal opinion, but I don't know how we would regulate the number of people uh, consuming that water on a daily basis. Yeah. It just seems like, I mean, I know you guys are considering it for the same reasons why I'm asking these questions, which is just, there's this good water source right in this town where we have lousy water. And just and so I'm just trying to um, find, if, see if there's any room for some creative thinking there and coupling those two uh, aspects. Um, and then I just wanted to thank you for, um, Continue for for reapplying the single use water bottle ban. Uh, with all due respect to my neighbors, I, I honestly don't see how single use water bottles. Um, I, I don't see why we need the single use water bottles. If when I buy water, I buy big containers of it. Um, 
so I appreciate you guys putting that band back in place. And um, thank you. Thanks, Susie. Anyone else? Block more time, Lee. Nothing. Hey. Bill. Oh. Ed. No. And nothing for me. Media time. We are adjourned by unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh,